Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me for a quick complimentary webinar on time management and task prioritization. I'm Stacy Schroeder, the president and founder of Evelop LLC, a training and consulting firm based in lovely Cleveland, Ohio. So let's go right ahead and get started today. So I've got some ground rules. Um, participate actively. We're using Zoom, so there's a chat box where you can ask questions, interact with each other, send questions or comments just to me or to the whole group. If you can, try to limit email and phone distractions and be sure to pay and interact so you get the most out of today's complimentary webinar. So why are we here? If you think about it, this quote really makes a lot of sense. Time is the coin of your life. It is the only coin you have and only you can determine how it will be spent. That's a quote from Carl Sandburg. So let's talk through the learning objectives. So after this webinar, what should you be able to do? So at the end of today's session, you should be able to explain some common approaches to prioritizing work, apply an approach to time management that works best for you, make time-related decisions based on what matters most to you, and deploy solutions for some common time suckers. So why are we here? I don't know about you, but I certainly have moments where I feel like I just need a little more time. Or I look at the clock and say, where did the time go? Time is limited. It's the one thing that all of us have an equal amount of, and it's in our control to use it effectively. So let's learn how. So what is time management? It's a term that's thrown around a lot, but one definition that I wanted to share with you guys is from the Oxford Dictionaries. Time management is the ability to use one's time effectively or productively, especially at work. So I'm curious, why is it important to manage our time? What jumps out at you from that definition? I'm betting that some of the things you might be thinking about are, there's less people at your company, perhaps. There's more responsibility that you're being assigned. And the to-do list can seem bigger and bigger with no end in sight. So it's important to use the time that you have in a way that's effective and productive. So what are some of the benefits of time management, do you think? Well, we talked about it a little bit. Increased productivity, decreased stress, Increased energy, which would be nice, allowing you to focus on what's important, enabling goal achievement, developing skills like delegating, prioritizing, planning, and organizing. As a society, we're moving away from clear and fixed boundaries between work and outside of work. Technology certainly plays a role in this, and this is more evident than ever with everything going on with COVID-19. But a lot of it's cultural too. It's more about work-life integration than balance or boundaries. So what implications does this have? What are some experiences that you've had around this? I know for me personally, being an entrepreneur, I work out of a home office. So I'm in my home all day long. What I like about this is it allows me the flexibility to weave in common household chores like laundry or maybe cooking something or going to the post office, checking the mail, walking the dog, etc. In times that work for me and work around my interactions with clients and prospects and meetings and work that I've got to get accomplished. But it also means that there's no one looking over my shoulder when I clock in or clock out, so to speak. So it's important for me to decide on average how much time I want to spend doing work and how much time I want to spend on things that are important to me. You got to make time for things that you say are important because your actions really show others what truly is important to you. So is it time with your partner or with your children, with your pets, with your friends, family, doing volunteering? Just think about how you want to spend your time. So we've got some self-assessments that are really helpful for time management. And what I'll do is I'll attach them as a resource. 
So you can take some time to review and reflect and figure out what areas you might wanna focus on based on the things that we talk about through the rest of the session today. So what are those key skills for time management? Like with anything, any concept, there's gonna be some key skills that go along with it. So I'd like to start with analyzing. So analyzing, without measuring something, it's hard to know where you are and where you have room for improvement. Making it a habit to look at where and how you spend your time helps you learn what you might want to adjust. Adjustments could be things like eliminating certain activities, rescheduling them, setting aside specific times of day for specific tasks. It could be ending or limiting relationships that are not beneficial, ones that take a lot of time and don't bring value to you. Now we've got controlling up here. I know that can seem like a negative word, but it's not always. Your time is limited and it's helpful for you to take charge of your days and your plans for them. It's okay to say no when necessary, and it's good to make a conscious decision on how to use your time. And it's helpful to use time management tools and approaches that work best for you. Now at the bottom, we've got delegating. Delegating is also a useful time management skill, and you don't need to have the formal manager or supervisor title to delegate. There's likely plenty of tasks within your department or team that fall within one person's area of expertise, and it's okay to move that type of work to them. Delegating when you're a team leader or a leader of an entire group of people, then it's more clear. You assign tasks to another person with clear expectations and follow-up but it's important to remember that delegating can be an effective strategy if done correctly, even if you're not in a formal leadership position. The next one I wanna review is goal setting. So goal setting, just like without knowing your baseline, you can't improve. You can't know if you're winning or losing if you don't have a clear goal. Setting up a plan with specific SMART, S-M-A-R-T goals is critical. The last one I have up here is prioritizing. It's important to have a set of criteria against which you evaluate tasks. These criteria could include alignment with goals and responsibilities, personal or professional values, deadlines, and or relationships. So now that we've covered the five key skills around time management, let's move into some specific approaches. So you'll see here I've got five approaches and we're gonna talk about each of them in a little bit of detail. So the first one I'd like to mention is Kanban. If you're familiar with lean, you may have heard this term before. Kanban is all about visual management. So the goal is to visualize your work so you can see it at a glance. And you want a system that makes it easy to add and remove and reorganize. So as you can see, we've got three main categories here, to do, doing, and done. And it's helpful to try to limit your work in progress. So how much stuff do you have in that doing column in the center? And it can help you visually see and share with others when you're getting to the point of too much multitasking or you're at risk for burnout. And this can be as simple as a whiteboard with some lines that you draw, for the three columns, and then you can use post-it notes so it's easy to move them around. You can do a little bit more fancy if you want. You could do a cork board where you're pinning on post-its or notes in three columns. You could paint a part of your wall with dry erase paint or with chalkboard paint, but there's no need to get complex to benefit from this type of visual management for time. The next one I wanna talk through is a really fun one. This is the Pomodoro technique. So this is a five-step cyclical process and all you need is a timer. It doesn't need to be a fancy tomato one. It can be the one on your phone or an egg timer or whatever you have. 
What I love about this one is it's really great when you're trying to eat the elephant. So if you've got a big project you're working on, so for me as a training consultant, when I'm designing new training, it requires a lot of focused time, but sometimes it can be hard to set aside big blocks of time. So what I'll do is I will do this type of process. So I'll choose the work I wanna get done. I'll set a timer for 25 minutes and I remove all notifications during this time. So I've got my phone off except for the timer. I have my email turned off and I make sure that I'm in an area where it's quiet and I'm not gonna get disrupted. And I focus on that particular task until I hear the timer ring. And then I take a five minute break. I stretch, I get some coffee, I walk around a little bit, pet the dog, and then I settle back in a five minute cycle. And you don't wanna do more than four of these in a row without taking a longer break. So if you're doing four of these, that's a pretty significant amount of time of intense thought work. So then it's time to take a little bit longer break. But I found this to be an extremely effective way when you've got to hone in and focus on a very complicated or a longer term project. The next one I want to talk through is the time matrix. So you may have heard of this. It's from Stephen Covey. So it helps you filter incoming tasks and information. And it's got two dimensions. So we've got urgent and important. So this is also pretty visual. Um, I've worked in pharmaceutical companies where I had a big whiteboard on the wall of my office and I just drew a couple lines and my team and I walked through all of our projects that we were working on and marked where they fit in this matrix. So quadrant one is both urgent and important. So things that fit that criteria are a crisis, very pressing problems, deadline driven projects. And then we've got quadrant two, which is important, but not urgent. So things like prospecting, finding new opportunities, building and maintaining relationships, more long-term planning, preventative activity. So preventative maintenance, um, looking at systems and processes that you have in place on sort of an audit basis, personal growth, recreation, You'll find if you're feeling stressed out and overloaded, things in this quadrant tend to slip. The next quadrant is quadrant three. So those are things that are urgent. So if you know people that seem to always be busy doing things, you might want to look at is a lot of their work fitting in quadrant three. So interruptions, emails, phone calls, meetings that could have been handled with an email, um, proximate pressing matters that have some sort of time basis to them. And then we've got quadrant four, which is neither urgent nor So that's busy work, uh, time wasters. Some calls and emails fit into this category. Some of the things that you might do to relax after work or with your family and friends might fit in there. So this is a useful tool to map out all the things that you have on your plate currently and see if you're spending the right amount of time on those things that are important. So the things above the line, whether they're urgent or not. And it's also a really useful approach if you work within a team or perhaps you're on a project with a group of people to do something like this as a group on a fairly routine basis. The next one we're gonna talk about is getting things done. So this is a really popular one. Um, David Allen wrote the book on this. So this one involves getting everything out of your head. So write down everything in your head, projects, recurring tasks, ideas, et cetera. Put them into a tool that fits your regular workflow. So it could be a calendar, a notebook, an app on your phone or tablet if you prefer. And then break things down into manageable actions. If it's quick, two minutes or less is sort of the guideline. Just do it. Delegate things where you can. 
and then organize the actions into categories, prioritize them, and assign deadlines. And then reflect. This is an ongoing process. So reflect on your action list, reprioritize as needed, and break down vague actions even further. If you can't understand exactly what needs done to move a project forward, you still need to get some clarity on the next action. It should be very clear what needs to get done. And I've got a flow chart here. So this is a helpful tool. You can find this online as well. There's a lot of additional resources on this method. The last one we're gonna talk about the action method. So the premise of this, the foundation of it, is that everything is a project with three components. So first, an action step, the specific task that moves the project forward. The second is reference. So animation for reference notes, website, books, et cetera. And the third is back burner items. So ideas are things that you wanna take action on later, but they're not critical at the moment. So group the steps, the references, and back burner items into one folder or notebook for each project, and use whatever scheduling tool you're most comfortable with to organize action steps. So we've looked at five approaches to time management. So now what I'd like to do is talk them through a little bit. So what seems easier natural to you? Which one sounds most interesting or fun? Which one do you think has the best chance of success for you? Because that's what matters, everyone is different. What works well with your existing tools or current work workflow? So think about these and I'll give you just a little bit more food for thought from my personal journey with time management. So for me, the getting stuff done, getting things done approach has been helpful. So I tend to work electronically. So what I've done is I've built a Google sheet that's next actions for the business and I categorize them based on the clients that I have at the moment. And then if it's something where I need more information, I've got some notes that I'll type in next to it. And then I give a, a date, a tentative date by which I'd like to work on it so that it can help me prioritize just by clicking on the due date column. And it was also helpful to get everything out of my head because your brain is really designed for thinking it's not designed for storing information. So some people have really great memories. I'm not saying that they don't. I'm just saying that to get the most you can out of your intellectual capacity, the better it is to take the clutter out of your brain and put it somewhere else where you can easily reference it. In terms of which one that I find most fun, I like the Pomodoro technique where I pick a project that I need to work on and I set a timer for 25 minutes and then I dial in and focus and eliminate distractions during that time. I found it to really unleash a lot of creative power to use that approach. So I just ask you to reflect on these questions for yourself. So let's switch gears briefly to talk about delegation. Delegating means letting others become the experts and hence the best. So delegating, depending on where you work and what your role is, can feel like a good word or a bad word. So I wanna spend some time with you guys on it. Delegating. So it's a valid option for managing work, even if you're not anyone's boss. Even in a small company or a one with a lot of individual contributors, there are still opportunities to improve overall workflow and efficiency by delegating. Sometimes it may entail working with the target person's manager to make sure the timing's right and you have the right understanding of their skills and responsibilities. Done well, delegating provides all of us more time to focus on what is important and builds trust and a shared sense of responsibility. So, why do it? We've talked through that, but then how do you do it? You've got to explain how. If you're a manager and you're delegating work, it's very important to focus on the result versus the how. 
unless it's governed by a critical procedure or regulation. Monitor progress and provide feedback at reasonable intervals. Keep communicating. Coach along the way. Don't take the work back. That can lead to resentment, disengagement, or poor morale. When delegating, clearly describe the work and explain how it fits into the big picture. Be specific, don't use the royal we. <laughs> Be specific with names, responsibilities, and dates. So I'd like you to think about, are there any tasks that you probably should or could delegate? What's been holding you back from doing so? What can you do to come up with a way to delegate it effectively? I love this picture. <laughs> We're gonna switch gears and talk about the big hindrance to productivity and time management, procrastination. So, I don't know about you, but I've certainly had times where I've procrastinated. Why do you find yourself procrastinating, if you ever do? Which of these reasons resonates with you? Is it because you are letting perfect get in the way of progress? So you want something to be fully polished and done and on a silver platter before you're going to be comfortable with it? Do you have negative self-talk? Are you not 100% confident about your skills for getting the particular work done? Is it you don't know where or how to start, so it just feels too big and too complicated, so you just try to ignore it? Is it a fear of failure or a fear of success? Are there too many distractions? Are you letting yourself be distracted too easily? Or is it just a task that you really don't enjoy? So take some time to reflect on those. And it's human nature to procrastinate, but the good news is there are proven ways to combat procrastination, and we'll cover those in just a moment here. So procrastination is more of a fallback technique for some people than others, and here are some ways to overcome the tendency to procrastinate. Some people say, do the unpleasant one first. Some people call that, eat the frog. So do the terrible, dreadful one first when you get to work in the morning. And then everything seems better after that because the hardest part's over. You can also break big jobs into smaller chunks. So then it's clear what the next step is. So that aligns really well with the getting things done approach and with the action approach. Another technique is to do something, no matter how small. So maybe it's a project that just seems overwhelming and you don't know where to start. Some things that you could do are to map out a timeline, to figure out what the major milestones are, to figure out who you could reach out to for a little bit more input and guidance, and then to actually schedule that phone call or meeting. Remove distractions. Set yourself up for success. Make sure your workspace reflects what you need to get done. Remove distractions if you need a lot of privacy or quiet for a particular task. Let your team know or book a conference room or see if you can work from home that day. Give yourself as many advantages as possible and reward yourself for accomplishments. Don't forget that a job well done deserves something of a reward. So now what I'd like to do is talk about two things. First, types of goals, and second, SMART goals. Because setting goals is closely related with managing time and prioritizing things. So let's first get into types of goals. The outcome or strategic goal is the overall result that you want to achieve. This could be something like save $2 million in inventory costs due to lean projects at our company in 2021. Or it could be successfully graduate 10 students from our new apprenticeship program by 2022. 
The next one is process or operational or tactical goals. So these are how you will go about getting to the outcome you want to achieve. For our stated strategic goal, the process goal could be identify 10 opportunities for Kaizen activities in our Northeast Ohio manufacturing campus. Or it could be create metrics around grades, engagement for the apprenticeship program. The third one is performance goals. So performance goals support the process goals to help reach the desired outcome. For our stated strategic and process goals, these could include things like schedule three Kaizen events by March 31st, 2021, or institute a timeline to check in with the students and their employers in the apprenticeship program. Hopefully those two different goals were helpful, and I'd encourage you to think through these three goals within your role and work with your manager to make sure that you're in alignment about that. So now I'd like to move into SMART goals. I'm betting most of you are familiar with this acronym, but we'll still go through it briefly. So S stands for specific. It's important that it's detailed enough to make the exact final result you want very clear. The outcome goal I gave on the last slide has this attribute. I told you the savings value and when exactly you need to find. The M stands for measurable. What does success look like? What's a measurement or metric that we could use? For the one I gave around lean projects, it was $2 million. A is attainable. This means that the goal is something that is reachable. It can be a challenge, certainly, but it shouldn't be so overwhelming that it leads to inaction. The R is for relevant. The goal should have meaning and be relevant to overall business goals or your goals if it's more of a personal objective of yours. And T is for time-based. A deadline helps keep you on track. The goal I gave was the end of 2022 for one of my examples. So as we talked about the three types of goals, I would break it down into smaller performance goals that were also time-based. Hopefully those examples helped and I would encourage you to weave together the three types of goals that we talked about on the previous slide, along with this explanation of what a SMART goal entails with your manager to make sure that you understand what you should be focusing on for your performance this year. So let's talk about obstacles. We're all in the real world and things happen that make it harder for us to get done what we need to get done. So what are some barriers that get in the way of your productivity? Is it phone calls? Is it emails, texts, maybe those pre-meetings or meetings before the meetings or unnecessary meetings? Is it constantly changing deadlines, unplanned office drive-by, not having the right people in meetings so you need to meet again with a different group of folks? Those are just some examples that I've certainly experienced and you know it's worth giving some reflection to see what are the barriers to productivity that you are encountering the most at your company. For me, one of the most common ones used to be the office environment. I worked in a place where I didn't have much insulation or soundproofing between my office and a conference room. So thankfully, when I needed to truly focus on something like building a training session like this, I would have the option to work remotely. Now that all I do is work remotely, it's more about sharing office space with my partner. So I'm the early bird, I do a lot of focus work alone between 7.30 and 10, and then I'll listen at a chill out station or something like that on Pandora or a streaming service at a low volume if I need to concentrate later in the day. Another one that I struggle with at times is urgent emails or voicemails from clients. I always want to provide good customer service, but I personally plan to work on carving out blocks of time two to three times a day to answer those types of requests versus dropping what I'm working on each time a call or email comes through. 
So I would just ask you to consider which of these types of barriers is highest priority for you to manage. What's going to make the biggest impact on your ability to be productive and manage your time? And think about what strategies you could use to effectively handle those barriers. I don't know about you, but I certainly relate to this picture. Do you have moments where you feel like this poor person? I know I do. So I'd like to turn our attention to some strategies to manage incoming information effectively. There are three approaches to handling the information that comes at you all day, every day. They're similar, so keep an eye out for the one that seems like it'll work best for you. The first one is the four Ds. Do it if you can do it in two minutes or less. Delegate it as soon as you can, if you can. Defer it. Schedule it on your calendar if you can't do it in two minutes, but you know that work does belong with you. Delete it if it's not related to an important goal or objective, or you can find it elsewhere, or you know you will need it in six months. Just get rid of it. The next one is traff. Toss it. Delete it. Refer it, similar to delegate, but doesn't have to include a specific objective for the person you sent it to and doesn't require follow-up. Act on it personally, schedule it or do it now, and then file it if it's something you might need to refer to later on. Fad, file the item away if you'll need it again. Act, reply, respond, delegate, forward it, do it, and then delete it. I'm curious which of those resonates most with you. So something to think through. I feel like I use the four Ds personally. I'm a big fan of using my calendar to track things that I need to do, but not right now. And sometimes it's helpful in personal life as well. So let's say that I've got a subscription service that I know I want to cancel right before it expires. I'll put that on my calendar on the day before. I use it for paying bills. There's a lot of ways that you can use the tools that you use every day to take things out of your head and put them in a system. I wanna shift gears here to service level agreements. So I'm curious if any of you have heard of this before. If you've worked in IT or in a customer support type of role, you may have. Service level agreements or SLAs are a good way to set expectations for those that you engage with. These include members of staff, it could even include family and friends if you want. Some of the things you may want to incur, include in a personal SLA are response time, when should a person expect a reply from you from an email or voicemail, availability, when should someone be able to reach you when you're at work and when you're away, how will you approach problems? Clarify what a person should expect when a problem arises. How and when will you communicate with them to resolve it? Follow-up. What should someone expect from you after discussing something and coming to an agreement on next steps? What sort of follow-up? Then lastly, quality. If someone's not happy with your work, how will you handle it? So I provided a handout and I'll include that along with this webinar and you can review it for more information. So with that, we've covered the topics that we set out to for today. So our learning objectives were to explain common approaches to prioritizing time, apply an approach to time management that works best for you, understanding how to make decisions based on things that are important to you and what you need to accomplish. And we talk through some solutions for common time suckers. So those typical barriers to productivity, procrastination, information overload, etc. So I'm hoping that you found this information useful. And before I leave you, I want to walk through just a couple more things to get you thinking about how to put what you've learned into action. So what I'd like you to do is pull out a piece of paper and on it, I want you to write a time management goal. 
Write down a technique you'd like to try for time management, one of the five that we walked through, and write down something you'd like to try for overcoming productivity barriers as well. And I wanna give you two items of homework and an offer for help. So your first piece of homework is to write your personal service level agreement. Include items such as what intervals you'll respond to emails and return voicemails and review documents. How you'll notify people of your absence, when you'll be unavailable, and the best way to reach you. This is for regular day-to-day -day work patterns and for when you're out of the office. The handout that I'll include would be a great starting point for this. Your second piece of homework is to identify a work-related goal, either one that you already know you need to accomplish or one that is relevant to your work. You'll write that down in the outcome goal section in the SMART format. And I'd like to offer myself as an accountability partner to you. If you send me your action plan, your service level agreement, and your work-related SMART goal via email, I'll read them and check in with you at least once before your goal see how you're doing, and if there's anything I can do to help. So with that, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, as always, for your attention and participation, and I look forward to working with you as your accountability partner, if you so choose. Take care, and all my best.